for our call to worship this morning, reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 28 and 29. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the hand of the heart, fainted not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increased strength. Amen. heart to us. Father, we just want to thank you for another privilege given unto us to be in the sanctuary today. We thank you for how far you've led us all through the week. Thank you for divine provision. Thank you for sound mind and good health. Thank you for being there for us at all times. Father, we just praise your name. In so many ways, we come short of glory. We ask for forgiveness of sin. Pray, Lord, that you forgive us. Lord God Almighty, we commit today's service into your care. Pray, Lord, that you take preeminent control. Commit the speakers of today into your care. Pray that you speak to her. Pray that on the head of the service, we have every reason to give you the glory. Pray for all the members, seated and those that are on their way. Pray that you be with us. Pray that you perfect all that concerns us. Lord God Almighty, today we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us remain standing for our opening hymn. It's number 108, Amazing Grace, number 108. We'll sing the first, third, and last version, uh, verses. Amazing grace. 
you so much, praise team. You sounded wonderful. Let's say amen in the house today. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen, amen. Welcome to the 31st Street Seventh-day Adventist Church. On behalf of Pastor Horatius Giddens, who is not with us today, uh, he's traveling with his family, so pray for him. And myself, Pastor Jacqueline Lawrence, I want to say welcome. We're so glad that you decided, even in spite of this gloomy weather, you decided to come and be in the house of the Lord and give him praise. Because we praise him whether it's raining or whether the sun is out, amen? Whether it's snowing or whether it's hailing, whether it's tornado, we're still going to give praise to God because he's worthy. So what Amen. is our tradition here at 31st Street Church that we get up out of our seats and we come and welcome you in the name of Jesus? Let's do that now. everybody. Good morning. All right, so I'm going to tell you a story today about a little bird named Billy. Has anybody ever heard the story of a bird named Billy? You probably haven't because I made up his name. Okay, so let me tell you about Billy. So Billy was a small bird. When he was born, he was in this very comfortable nest with mommy and daddy and some brothers and sisters. Any of you guys got brothers and sisters? Raise your hand. Everyone. Okay, great. So the nest for us would be like a house. Anybody has a nice bedroom, nice house, nice bed to sleep in? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Just, there you go. Okay. So, so now Billy was in his nest, and he just enjoyed himself. It was comfortable. It was warm. All the food he can eat because mom gave it to him, just really gave it to him. And um, one day, mom and dad says, Billy, it's time to learn how to fly. He's like, I don't want to learn how to fly because I'm comfortable. I'm warm. I'm fed. My belly's full. For what? Why do we need to fly for? So they were like, you got to get your, get your wings strengthened. You got to get strong. So Billy, you know, he just refused. And one day, mom and dad had to push him out the nest. And he was struggling. He looks worse than I do right now. And all of a sudden, before he could fall, mom picked him up, brought him back up, and then taught him how to use his wings. And when he got pushed out again, he was flying. And he loved to fly. He flew all the time. Day, night, and it was bedtime, he was frustrated because he wanted to fly. He loved it. So that was his thing. So then one day, mom and dad came up to him and said, Billy, it's time for us to prepare to go down to Florida, down south, because it's about to get really cold, and we can't stay here when it's cold. I don't want to go to Florida. I've never been to Florida. I don't know anybody in Florida, and I don't know what Florida's like. I don't want to go. Well, that's too bad. We got to go because we can't stay here. It's going to be too cold. So everybody packed up, and they got ready to go to Florida. And they flew off. Billy flew off, too, but he was not happy. And then so as he was flying, he looked around, and he saw the places that he knew and he knew he would miss. And then he started seeing places that he didn't know, and he got scared and said, why do we have to go to Florida? So you know what Billy did? No, seriously, do you know what he did? What do you think he did? Flew away? Well, he was already flying. Yeah. Yes, he did. He flew back home. He turned around, and he flew back home. And he went inside of his nest. And he stayed in his nest. And he enjoyed himself. And then he realized the food wasn't coming. And then you know what else came? It got cold. It got cold. And Billy's like, oh, my nest isn't so warm anymore. It's cold. So what do you think Billy did? 
Yeah, he started flying back to Florida. But it was already too late, it was cold. So as he's flying, it's cold and he's trying his best and it's getting colder and colder and this white stuff started coming out the sky and it's extremely cold as it's touching him and next thing you know, he couldn't fly anymore and, he, and then he fell from the sky and he landed and something green looks like grass. He landed in grass. And um, all of a sudden, he was stuck. He was frozen. He couldn't move. Mom and dad had this feeling. Billy is not, where's Billy? Oh, no. He probably went back this bird. So he, mom just went ahead and went back. But Billy was frozen on the ground, and he couldn't move. And so, but that's not it. There was a cow, saw Billy, and he walked over to Billy. He saw him, and then he turned around, he squatted, and you know what he did? He pooped on him. He pooped on Billy. And Billy's like, oh, that's just wrong. I'm already frozen, I can't do it, wait a minute. Oh, I can move now. Wait, my wings are, I can move my wings. I can, oh, I can move. Oh, I'm feeling, uh, because the poop is warm. It was warm, so it started to um, freeze, Billy. It was, I was like, yeah, I know, it's nasty. It's, it's, but this is what happened to Billy. I'm telling you about Billy. Okay, and so he began to be able to fly, and then he saw his mom, and then they were able to travel back to Florida. Does anybody want to know what the moral to the story is? Oh, no mic? What do you think this story is about? Listen to your parents. They, all, they know what's great. They know what's best for you. Even though you don't understand, you got to trust them. That's like Jesus. He tells us in the Bible, you know, love your neighbors, love God. Love your neighbors, love God, love your neighbors, love God, love your neighbors, because he knows what's best for us. Even though it doesn't make sense and we don't want to all the time, but trust him because he knows what's best, because one day there's going to come a time where we got to, you know, maybe pack up or maybe fly away, but we want to go when God tells us so it's not too late. And there's one more moral to the story for us adults. Everybody that poops for you is not your enemy. Do I have somebody who wants to pray for us? Who wants to pray? All right. Let's bow our heads. Everybody bow your heads. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Thank you for bothering me and, and, and the, my mommy and daddy and Jesus name. Amen. 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 Okay, you guys can go back to your seats. Happy Sabbath, church family. I'm Courtney. I'm the communications department leader. And here comes the person that's going to speak. Yeah, so this young man is very handsome, but a little shy. So um, uh, unfortunately, today is Ventisha's last day. Uh, Ventisha that I do not see. Here she is, coming down the aisle. <laughs> So Ventisha has been a member of this church for several years. She has, uh, thank you, Courtney, you're like a, a mother or a wife unto me. Um, um, and uh, Ventisha, so unfortunately, she's leaving to go back to Florida. And all I can say is that we will miss you. And I thank you so much for all what you have brought here. And I'm sure that uh, God will, uh, will prepare a path for you so that you can grow professionally for yourself but also bring your charming touch to others so thank you so much for having been part of this team i want Ventisha to say a few words i know she does but she's my child so she has to do what i say <laughs> okay thank you guys so much i really appreciate it and I just wanna say um, for the past, I think I've been coming, coming to this church for four years and I've lived in San Diego for five years. So I just appreciate each and every one of you for becoming my family. I've been out here in San Diego by myself and I've said this before, but you guys have all been 
a part of my mother's answered prayers because she didn't want me to be alone. And so just hearing stories of each and every one of you, she feels like she knows you as well. And so when she came to visit, she was so excited to put faces to the names of who I've been talking about over the years. So I am leaving. This is not goodbye. This is see you later because I will be back to visit. And who knows, someday I may come back and, and live here again. But um, as I go back to the East Coast, I'll always be able to say that I have family in California. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Vantation Communication Department. Let us remember when, this, when we exit out, everyone give Vantisha a hug. And if you want to add to that envelope, just you know, press it into her hand as God well, blesses our, and leads. Um, special music today is Baron Peeler. And I'm not just pulling him out of the audience because he came to visit at church but this time he's invited, and we are so happy to have Baron to come and minister for us. Thank you, Sister Mary. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? It's so good to be here in the house of the Lord here. And at 31st, it's my second home, my San Diego home, and uh, it's something that brother Tony, brother Tony was talking about, about uh, this war and guns. Guns aren't the answer. Fighting is not the answer. That's not the way. I'm telling you, because Jesus Christ, he is the way. He's the truth, he's the life. He's my God, and I hope he's your God. When I think about the hour, then I know what I must do. Christ is the way. How many of you know that? Oh, no one knows the day, nor the hour may be more night or Just to rest assured, time will be no more. He is coming soon. I know, I know he's coming soon. And I, I, I will open up. Christ is the way. Then I, I will open up my heart. I will open up my heart to Christ is uh, the way. I know Jesus Christ. I'll 
Today's reading comes from Genesis 15, 3 through 7, and the second reading comes from 1 John 5, 11 through 13, and I will be reading from the um, New International Version. Please stand. <clears throat> and Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant of my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. <clears throat> he also said to him, I am the Lord who bought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this to give you this land to take possession of it. The second reading comes from 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And the scripture reads, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. God gave us breath. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, he gave us the breath of life. We're here today. So no matter what else is going on in your life, the fact that you were able to inhale and exhale gives us a reason to praise the Lord. Praise is an active thing. So I can sit here and I can, you know, praise God and say hallelujah, amen. But praise, when we enter into the court, we're going with thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for everything you've done. Then we're going to praise him. We use our body. We say praise the Lord. And then we go into worship and we sing. Waymaker. Has God done anything for you today, church? Have you ever been through a situation where you felt like you weren't going to make it out and he made a way for you? You didn't see how. And you said, oh Lord, we praise you. Huh. There are times when it's so dark and you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel and he's our light in darkness. Yes, he is. He pays our bills. He helps us in school. He helps us on the job. He helps us our work. He helps our bike to work. He helps our feet work. Hallelujah. We sing, oh Lord, we praise you. I'm going to be honest. When I listen to this song, I got to listen to it about three times to really get into it. Just the first time, I kind of like, mm -hmm. that sounds good. And then the second time, I'm like, yeah, I like this. All right. And the third time, I need to praise the Lord. And I'm like, yeah. Oh Lord, we praise you. Oh Lord, we praise you. You sing. Oh Lord, we praise you. 
knows who he is. So we said thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for who you are. Again, we said thank you for everything that he's done. Yeah. Now we just thank him for everything that you are. We say, God, you made a way. You worked that out. We said he did that. <laughs> he worked those miracles for us. He is that light in the, tar the darkness. That is who he is. Yeah. 
keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. He's my way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who Second Chronicles 7, 14 reads, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. This is prayer time, church. For those that wish to join us up front, I invite you to come down. Others may wish to stay at their seats. Others may wish to stand. Our focus family for prayer this week are Catherine, Catherine Armstrong and family, Radel and Dietra Williams, Elijah and Nia, their daughter and son, in prayer. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims. Be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Lord, we come to you this morning, first of all, to thank you for the many blessings that you have provided us this past week. You know, Lord, sometimes we take it for granted, the things that we do become automatic, not realizing that it's through your power and your kindness and love why we are operating the way we are. We travel on the highways and you protect us there. We cross the street, and you protect us there. You even protect us, Lord, when we don't even know what we're doing. We bring to you this morning family members, church members, who are ill and shut in. And we ask for you to place your loving arms beside them on this Sabbath day, this hour of prayer. We pray for Kurt Brown, Chester Ewing, Modesta George, Corrine Johnson, Elsie Johnson, Gloria Johnson, Wilma Love Lovelace, Peggy Miller, Rosetta Phelps, Kitty Prothro, Erica Ram Enrique Rarim Ramirez, Charles Robinson, Evelyn Rowe, Cindy Todd, Sandy, Sandra Ruff, Ress, Wes, Kidron Woods, and Maxine Williams. Lord, you know there are many challenges, and we ask you to heal them if it's your will today. Lord, as our faces differ so that our needs and wants and desires, we ask, Lord, to be with those that are in need of work, those that are underemployed, working two and three jobs to make ends meet. We ask your blessings upon those that are suffering with loneliness, depression, and other challenges that we humanly have each day. Lord, we don't know what the future holds for us, but we know who holds the future. And we ask in a very special way that you remember us as we trudge, trudge these, this world of ours in these last days, preparing for your soon return. You tell us to come to you as a friend, and that's exactly what we're doing today. We ask you to place your loving arms around us, Lord, and comfort us 
because we are living in a dangerous world. Be with our pastor and his family that are the way, our associate pastor, also she's filling in. And we ask you to be with our speaker for today, Lord. Might the message that is provided be something that is timely and well needed for us today. Be with each home represented in this circle, in this family circle. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. morning church happy sabbath church how many love jesus oh this is the right group god love a cheerful giver and you are here because you love jesus and you give to him because you love him isn't that right now somebody has said there are three kinds of givers one is a flint giver you strike a stone, and all you get is a spark. The second kind of giver, of giver is a sponge giver. You have to squeeze a sponge in order to get water out, right? <laughs> Next time is a honeycomb giver. The honey just overflows freely. Isn't that something? But the Lord say he lays claim on our income, on our money. It's one of the gifts, the talents that he gives. Now the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And they that dwell therein. Everything already belongs to God. But he says, bring you all the tithe in the storehouse. The tithe's a tenth, right? So, but he said, you rob me and tithe and an offering. Well, did you know that withholding God's tithe or offering is breaking two commandments at once? The eighth one and, and the tenth one. Isn't that something? Plus, you're breaking the first one. You're putting something before God. Will the officers now come forth to receive the morning tithe and offering? Won't you give liberally today because you really love Jesus? You wouldn't be here unless you loved him. Gracious Father in heaven today, day in the name of Jesus, we pray that your spirit will guide us as we consider the lack of finance in our budget to cover what it takes to run this church and to overflow into the community to evangelism. We pray that keep us and save us in your eternal kingdom because we've been faithful in all things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. song that they sang earlier about a way maker, light bearer, because of who he is. And because of who he is, we give him the glory and the praise and honor to his name. I'd like to have the praise team come and I just thank you for chipping in and singing this song and 
even if you know it, I want you to add to this song. Because of who you are, because of who you are. 
worship you and I worship you because of who you are. Indeed, because of who you are, Lord, we worship you. We worship you, Lord. There has been worship already. I hope you had worship before you even got here this day. But if you haven't, you've had an opportunity since you've been here, and we're going to worship some more. I just want to make a note here that following this service today, we'll have second service, which is from 3 to 4, and that is a community service that we have. And so uh, Pastor Tony Avila, he's going to be speaking this afternoon. That's from 3 to 4. And then we have at 5 o'clock, we have our youth program. There is time all throughout this Sabbath day to give worship to our Father and fellowship one with another. Amen? Amen. But I also want to uh, draw your attention to Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights, we are having a good time. If anybody is here who is here on Wednesday nights, say Amen. 
Amen, amen. We are growing, and we are always praising the Lord each Wednesday. So I want to invite you and then have you invite a friend to come out Wednesday evenings because prayer meeting is a time where we can pray, give testimony, and to strengthen one another in the word of the Lord. Amen? If you need strengthening Wednesday night and Sabbath and all through the week, all through the day is the time to strengthen your soul with the word of God. Amen? So how can I know that I've been saved? We're going to discuss this today. How can I know that I've been saved? And I know that this is a question many of us may ask, but there is an answer. So we're going to pray, Father God, I thank you this morning, Lord, that before we even opened our eyes, Lord, you kept our lungs moving, moving and breathing and expanding and contracting, Lord, and you caused it, Lord, to open our eyes and allow us, Lord, to think, to put our, our feet on the floor and to make our way to this place today. Father, you have opened our eyes so that for those that are tuning in, Lord, that they have directed their steps, Lord. You've ordered their steps to be able to watch and to commune and to fellowship, Lord, with you through our service. And Father, I just want to ask now that, Lord, your Holy Spirit, Lord, would just reign in this place today. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit, Lord, would tug on hearts, Lord, and open up minds and ears and recommit, Lord, the faith that your believers have in you, dear Father. And for me, O oh Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would just shield me, dear Father, so that only your words are heard, Father. Your power is only made visible, dear Father, in the lives of your people. So make me the humble spirit, O oh Lord, and I just know that it's nothing, Lord, that I have to say, but it's only, Lord, what you have to say to your children. And so, Father, we thank you and we lift you up in this place today. In the worthy name of Jesus, may souls be saved unto your kingdom. Amen. Amen. So how can I know that I'm saved? Questions that need answers. I'm going to spend these moments just to talk to you about this because who even asks a question like this? How do I know that I'm saved? Well, is it a person that asks this question? Is it someone that actually believes in God? Is it someone who believes in the Holy Spirit? Are they the people that ask this question? How do I know that I'm saved? Well, what are you saved from? Saved from what? Are you, are you saved from danger? Or are you saved from just harm's way? What is it that you are saved from? Are you saved from death? Well, in the context of our Christian experience, I would say that saved from danger safe from harm's way, safe from the enemy's attacks on our lives, and ultimately safe from death makes this a very important question. And the death that I speak of is not just the physical death, but it's the eternal death that we are saved from. We have been extended the opportunity for eternal life, being saved from eternal death. This Christian experience that we have, we understand that sin is the transgression of the law. Somebody say sin. sin. It's the transgression of the law, and the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. But it is the grace, by grace, that we are saved from sin through faith in a Savior that shed his blood for the remission of our sin, which gives us pardon from what? Death. We have a Savior who gave his life so that we don't have to pay the penalty for the sin in our own lives. The penalty for that sin is eternal death. But we have an advocate. So the death that I speak of when I say save from what? It's eternal death. And when I'm asking how can I know that I've been saved, I've got to think of it in that perspective. Eternal death. Eternal death, that's separation from God forever. I don't want to be there. 
This question is not asked uh, only here in these modern times that we're living in, that we're existing right now, but it was likely that a question that had been asked in times past, and this times past actually goes back, it dates back to some time after A.D. 60 through 90. A.D. 60 through 90, this is after the, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. We're talking about a long time ago. So individuals were asking this question even that long ago. And the reason that I know that this question was being asked is because the writer of the scripture that tells us about this lived and was an eyewitness to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We're in the epistle of John. This is the first of three epistles of John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, which precede the book of Revelation. And this author, he thought it was worthy to write a word that would let us know that indeed we are saved, we have eternal life. Somebody say eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal life. The book of 1 John, it was written by the apostle John, who along with his brother, his brother's name was James, and Jesus himself titled them, gave them the name Sons of Thunder. You can find that in Mark uh, chapter 3, verse 17. And John, he was a follower of Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus. He supported Jesus in his public ministry as a disciple. He was called early one morning in a boat along with the fishers, fishermen, to become fishers of men. And so as a disciple, John was right there with Jesus. He was in the trenches. He was in the good times, the bad times. He was in the inner circle with Jesus. He was not only a disciple, but then Jesus later called him into a closer fellowship as one of the apostles one of the 12 apostles. So John served Jesus in Galilee, and he was present at his crucifixion. And after Christ's ascension, John became known as one of the pillars of the church. He was one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem, along with James, his brother, and Peter. And we know that Peter was a great pillar of the church. So these three were in the inner circle, as I said, with Jesus. And John himself is further identified as the one whom Jesus loved. Jesus himself said that John was the one that Jesus loved. And you can find that in 1 John 13, 23, 3, 23. So the things that John wrote were very important. Not only were they very important, they were like right there. They were meaningful because he witnessed so much. He gave a firsthand account, and he was actually inspired by these things, the testimony, the word, and gave a word of wisdom and counsel to those that were around him. Now, John, he wrote this book, and I would say that it contains passages that are most important to whom he was writing then and now. And these passages that we're focusing on today in 1 John chapter 3, but all of 1 John, and then 2 John, 3 John, but all of 1 John, these words that he wrote were actually for the people in Ephesus. This was, Ephesus was a church in, in Asia. And these churches were well established in the Christian faith. They were well established in the doctrine of Christ. The early church was happening. They were on fire. They were on the move. And so these individuals that John wrote these letters to, he called them his children, his brethren. And these individuals were grounded in their faith. In other words, John wrote these three epistles to believers. He wrote them to the church. He wrote them to church folk. He wrote them for folks like you and me, people who are believers. And I know that those that know Christ 
They know him as the Son of God. They know him as the slain Redeemer and the risen Savior. So these are people who know what and who Jesus is. But the time in which he wrote this book, he wrote the words not only out of concern for them, because at that time in the Ephesus church or the Ephesian churches, they were, although they were steadfast, steadfast in their truth, their words... Uh, that were around them and the environment around them was being threatened by the worldliness and the lure of worldliness. And it was also being threatened by the guile of false teachers. So while it was prevalent back then, we're talking about this AD 60 through 90, you had body of believers, church people, But yet, at that time, they were even then still being threatened by worldliness and false teaching. Here we are in 2018. Are we threatened by the lure of worldliness? Are we threatened by the the beguilement of false teachers? Constantly. We just saw it up on the screen. People in the name of God talking about what was going to rule the land. There is beguilement going on and there is false teachings that are going on. That does not represent the Christ that I know and love. I know that it doesn't represent the Christ that you know and love. So there there is a theme all throughout the first John, and that is fellowship with God. John wanted his readers to have the assurance that their lives are tucked away safely with Jesus as long as they stay in relationship with him. So we're going to focus on three things that John, and three reasons why John actually wrote this epistle. He says in 1 John 1 through 4, you can turn there if you like, and I'm going to just make this little commercial here, that 1 John is actually five chapters. It's just five chapters. Now, you know that this year, the pastor has given us a formula for how we read the Bible throughout the year. Three chapters a day during the week and five on Sabbaths. So I can encourage you to take these five chapters in 1 John later on today. If you haven't read your five chapters today, this is the perfect five chapters to read. So there's your commercial. We want to write to you, this is what John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. He says, we write these things that your joy may be full. Second thing that he said, he said that we may sin not. That's 1 John 2, 1. And then thirdly, he said, we write these things that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm going to read the full text in, uh, from the New King James. And this is in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. It says, these things I have written to you To you who believe, you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. The word has power. The word has power. Not only does he say he wrote these things that we may know that we have eternal life, but that we may continue in the knowledge that we have. So let me just say this. Since this book was written to those that believed, I would maintain that there are no passages of Scripture more important for believers, believers in the Son of God, that is found in 1 John. That you as a believer know that you have eternal life. So let's discuss these three things. The first was that he wrote so that our joy would be full. Do you know what it is to be full? When you're full, you're like overflowing. You can't put anything else in, but you know, God designed it that when you're full, you overflow, but then it kind of makes room and you just keep flowing. So there has to be something said to a religion that doesn't have joy. So I'm precious, and I I think it's precious, and I think it's wonderful that the Lord has given us joy, and John wrote to us to tell us that our joy should be full. See, this walk with Jesus is something that ought to give you joy. You remember when you were a little kid and you used to sing the song, I've got joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? 
down in my heart. So, I mean, the joy has got to be down in your heart. Now, where does the joy come from? It comes from the relationship that you develop with Jesus Christ. You've got to stay in the word. John wrote to us that our joy would be full. Not only does he say it in 1 John 1 through 4 or 1, 4, he says it also in John 15, 11. This is the gospel of John, John 15, 11. He says it one more time in John 16, 24. And since he was an eyewitness to Jesus, he was an eyewitness also to the time at which he told, Jesus told his disciples that your joy would be full. He in fact told them, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. We have an opportunity to have a full and joyful life because of our relationship with the Lord, which means that we can ask him anything, and within his will, he will give us joy, answer, and hear our prayers. The second thing that uh, John wrote and why he did write to us is that we might not sin. Now, it doesn't say that we won't sin, But there is a difference that we might not sin. That means that we are not in the practice of sin. We ought not be as believers, as Christians, in the practice of sin. You see, when we practice something, we're getting better at our craft. We don't need to be practicers of sin. See, when you're a doctor... Dr. Freitas, he's a doctor. He's licensed to practice medicine. Sister Joy, she's licensed to practice law. She's a practitioner of the law. We don't have license here to practice sin. We don't need to be full-time practitioners of sin. But as Christians, we have a Savior. He gives us free will. He gives us free choice, but he has not made us robots to worship him. He gives us free choice. But with our free choice, we need not be practitioners of sin. We don't need to choose sin. Because if we do sin, glory, hallelujah, and the mercy of God, he has given us an advocate. You see, all have sin. That's me and you. It doesn't say y'all have sinned. That's all of us, me and you. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. But we do have an advocate with the Father. That means someone who's standing in for us, pleading our case before the Father. And I think that anything that tells us about the covering of sin and the advocacy that the Lord Jesus has for us is found again in John. This is John 3.16. I am sure many of you know this. So if you know it, I want you to recite it with me. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So everlasting life, that's what? Eternal life. Eternal life, the opposite of eternal death. Now that text in John 3, 16 doesn't just stop there. It goes on further in verse 17 that says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world, through him, might be saved. God wants us to be saved. He doesn't just automatically say, okay, everybody's saved, that's it, party's over. No, he gives us the opportunity, the invitation to receive salvation. Now, I would say, saints... I would say believers, the body of believers, that we are to practice righteousness. For he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. That's 1 John 3, 7. See, we're moving right through 1 John. 1 John 1, our joy would be full. 1 John 2, that uh, we might not sin. And 1 John 3 says that we should practice righteousness just as he is righteous. So if there's anything that we ought to be practicing, it is practicing how Jesus lived. Jesus lived in fellowship with one another, with his brothers, with his sisters. He was always kind. He was always reaching out. He was showing mercy. Relationship was important to Jesus. Now, thirdly, 
John writes to us, he writes to this body of believers that in 1 John 5, 13, it says that we may know that we have eternal life. Jesus, he writes these things so that we would have confidence, we would have assurance in this Christian experience. So I'm just going to recap again. We know that the first text in there says that, he, that John wrote, he said that he writes these things that our joy would be full and that we sin not and that we may know that we have eternal life and that we are saved through faith. But also not just saved, that we would continue in this journey. See, this will give us confidence. See, when we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we love one another, we will have confidence. And the text goes on to say that we will not be ashamed before him at the judgment, at his coming. So, friends, we have to live with confidence because confidence will give us assurance. And I'm not talking about arrogance, that I'm saved and somehow I'm now elite and I don't have to worry about anything. I'm saved through grace by faith in a Savior who gave his life. That is something to be joyful about. So somebody say confidence. See, some things in life we can be uncertain about. But I tell you today, our salvation is not one of them. See, I can be uncertain about whether or not I watch the news cycle and it's truth or it's fake news. I can be uncertain about whether or not the weatherman says it's going to rain and it does rain or it doesn't rain. I can be uncertain about that. But I don't need to be uncertain about whether or not I've been given the opportunity to experience eternal life and saved from eternal death. So we can't afford to be uncertain about this. How can we be a witness or have a testimony about something that we're not even certain about? How can we do it? I can be uncertain about so many things, but this thing is something for me not to be uncertain about. I would say it's very unsettling if I know that anybody in the body of believers in the church, dare I say 31st Street Church, both young and old, who at times living with uncertainty about their salvation. But I know it may exist. So when we talk about John writing these things, when it, he wrote to the body of believers back in those Ephesian churches, even though these things were happening and they were grounded in the truth, he felt it necessary to tell them and remind them and inform them that they need to know that they have eternal life. So I'm going to say that this confidence that we're supposed to have is very, very important. And the fact that he wrote it to a body of believers, a body of believers meaning people who came to church, people who went to Sabbath school, people who attended maybe a Christian school, an academy, somebody who maybe was a pathfinder, somebody who was a deacon or a deaconess, an elder or a preacher. At somewhere along the way, we know that there is a discourager among us. He exists in this world, and sometimes he causes us to doubt. But John reminds us that we may know that we have eternal life. So, I'm going to say that there are three guides that help me to know that I have eternal life. And before I go there, I just want to say that just when we talk about this body of believers, and even though sometimes we might feel like, well, am I saved? Am I, do I, do I have eternal life? If Jesus were to come tomorrow, would I be ready? You know, we go through these things sometimes, and there is this teaching for all of us who have been in the church for a very long time. And we've been hearing the word about Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon. And then we say, well, where is he? But you know what? It's his mercy that allows us to have the opportunity to keep on in this faith, to keep on in this journey before he says the final words. It's his mercy. He's giving us time to get ourselves together. It's, he's refining our characters. 
I would say that these three guides that help me know that I am saved and that I have the assurance of eternal life is simply this. God said it. I believe it. And God has already proved it. I say God said it because God's word is true. For he is his word. He says he is his word. I want to, I want to pull this to you. One night we said this in a prayer meeting, and I couldn't find the exact verse. And I always know that, you know, the Gospel of John starts off with the, uh, the words that, you know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. We know this. But again, I came across this in 1 John a few weeks ago, and I said, for, it says in 1 John 5, 7, it says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Who is the Word? Who do you know who is in heaven with God the Father and the Holy Spirit? Jesus. It says that, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. The Word is Jesus. How do we get to know Jesus? We've got to stay in his Word. His Word These pages are just as good as it coming out of his mouth, standing here beside us, talking to us, texting us, sending us an email, calling us on the phone. This is Jesus talking to us. If we want to be in relationship with him, we've got to know what he has to say. How do we know what he has to say? We've got to read the word, read his word. So God said it. His word is true. Whose word do you want to believe? Do you want to believe somebody, just anybody else's word? I mean, we can barely count on some things said by some people. But I can say that the word of God is true. I can depend on the word of God. Amen? His word is sure. We may not be able to believe just anybody, but God promises He makes promises to his people. Has God ever broken a promise? Is there anything God can't do? He can't break his promises. So we are to stand on the promises of God. We are a body of believers that can stand on his word. So let me tell you about one of those promises that God said. Because God said it, I believe it, and he's already proved it. That's how I know that I can have eternal life. So In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says that for by grace, for by grace, we are saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we must accept this gift in faith that it will be what God said and that it will be exactly as he promised us. So when I think about this, I says, it says, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we talk about practicing, not practicing sin and practicing righteousness, but it's not of ourselves. It's not our own works. See, I can't live my life thinking that my measurement of sin and in my life is based on my own standard. Because, see, I'll wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror and I was like, okay, I haven't done nothing yet, so I'm good. I'm I'm not sinful. We are saved through grace by the covering of Jesus Christ. He's done the work. It's for us to accept the gift. So we don't have foresight like God. We don't have the, the knowledge, the omniscience to know what it is that will come into here or there. So we've got to rely upon the word of God. We've got to rely upon his promises. This is why we read from the Old Testament, that reading that we had, that Abraham heard what God said. He said, look at the stars. Number, you can't even count them. This is going to be who your heirs are. And what did Abraham do? He believed God because God said it. He believed it. And then what did God do? He proved it. So I want to say that the second reason that I know that I'm saved is not just because God said it and he gave us the promise, it's that I believe it. When you read, you, when you go home and you read your five chapters today and you read in 1 John, you'll see that each of these times it says that you may believe. 
So God's word tells us something, but it says to those that believe. So believing in the Lord is imperative to this Christian experience, to this relationship that we have. So in, in Genesis 15, when, when Abraham said that, he actually believed it. Abraham, he proved that already also himself because what he did is when the Lord told him to take that child, that child he had prayed for, that child that he gave him, do you know that he said, go there and you're going to take this child? He knew that like, well, where's the sacrifice, Lord? He knew, he said, just go, I'll tell you later. And he went, he believed God. And what did God do? Just as he promised, he provided a sacrifice. He didn't have to go forward and to kill his son. Now, you know, in the New Testament, over 124 times, the word believe is used. Right here in the book of 1 John chapter 5, the word believed is used six times. So it's written at least 24 times in the Old Testament. So to believe, it's essential to our knowing how it is that we have eternal life and that we have the confidence and the assurance that we are saved. Now, the third tool that I use, as I said, is that God said it. I what? Believe it. And the third thing is that God proved it. You see, God proved it, and we have read it already. He loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and so it would be that we would not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know everlasting life? Everlasting life. We're talking about life. We're not talking about, and we think about this life. This life, we might think it's good and that, okay, yeah, things are well. I have this warm bed to sleep in at night, and I can drive a, 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 a nicer car. And even when it's not the nice car and it's the hoopty car, you just still are like, okay, well, this is a good life. But guess what? We have a life that we don't even imagine or can even think about that the Lord has prepared for us. He says, I go to prepare a place for you that when you, when you get there, we are going to have this eternal fellowship. So I want to say this, that God, he sent his son. His son was the manifestation of himself in human form. But this same human form person that we call Jesus, he gave his life in place of our sinful lives. I'd say that that was proof enough that God loves us. So he said it, I believe it, and God has already proved it, which is why I know that I have the assurance of eternal life, that I am saved. If we operate in our own works, friends, we just run the risk of thinking that we're doing better than we are. We can think about this being better than we are. We're going to run the risk of either two things, thinking that we're doing too good or not good enough. And this is dangerous ground for us to be standing on because we lose focus on the fact that it was Christ who died for us, that our sin is covered. You see, I want to look in the mirror, and I always want to see a reflection of Jesus. I don't want to see me. I want to see Jesus. And that mirror, he gives us opportunity. When we, have, when we have challenging situations, we're looking in the mirror. We want to be able to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus, and we want to be able to reflect Jesus. We heard in Sabbath school there was a situation that, might, uh, that happened with the, the, the food distribution. We hear, we talk to friends that sometimes people come at them in certain ways. This is our opportunity to have the mirror and reflect Jesus. We need to know and understand and have the assurance, the confidence that Jesus has died for us, he has given his life, and that we have an opportunity to receive the gift that he gave us called eternal life. You see, it's hard to lose a salvation that has been given as a gift from God. But a salvation that we pick for ourselves Oh, yes, I can lose that. I can lose that from morning to lunchtime. I can lose that from lunchtime to dinner. I can lose that between dinner and the midnight snack because everything that I do would then be conditioned upon how I'm saved, if I'm good, if I'm bad, if I'm too good or if I'm too bad. So keeping it grounded in the faith of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice 
That's the salvation and the place of salvation that we need to be. Because God's salvation, it reaches deep. It reaches high. It reaches low. It reaches wide. It then goes above. It goes below. It kind of goes around about. Jesus' salvation is full. It's everything. And I would say it's pardon from sin. That's unmerited favor. That's what grace is. You know, have you ever gotten something that you didn't deserve? How did you feel about it? Were you grateful? Were you like, oh, snap, I didn't deserve that, <laughs> but I got it. You, you, you feel, you, you know your place at that moment, that you were not worthy of something, but you got it anyway. So let's just magnify that a gazillion times when it comes to the sin that's in our lives. But you know, this salvation that we have is a salvation that comes from God, and we don't need to choose to overlook it. We don't need to choose to overlook it. So while salvation is there, and John tells us that we know that we have eternal life, we can choose not to accept it. I don't want you to say like, oh, well, I was feeling so good. Uh, why are you going to bring me down? We can lose this salvation. He has already provided it. He has made a way. It is there for us. We have to continue, is how the text said. It says he wrote that we would know that we have eternal life and that we may continue to believe on the Son of God. So indeed, the choice is ours. I said earlier that God has created us with free will and free choice. What we do with the free will and what we do with the free choice is very important. We can choose to give up eternal life. The Bible teaches that as soon as anyone accepts Christ's offer of salvation, he immediately, say immediately, immediately is forgiven of their sins. Amen. You have complete reconciliation with God when you accept his righteousness to cover your life. 1 John 1, 9 tells us this. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 tells us that eternal life is ours as Christ's righteousness covers the sin of the repentant believer. So when God says that you have this eternal life, that you accept my righteousness, it's as good as money in the bank. See, when God says you got money in the bank, you can start writing checks. Okay? You can go to the bank. You can withdraw the money because God said it, and I believe you're going to believe that. And then he proved it because we can live this life. He has not taken his his wrath against sin, and not allowed us to live. So we still have a choice in the matter. This saved condition can be lost through our apostasy. Now, that's the, the biblical word, apostasy. But apostasy simply means that we depart from your religion. When you depart from one's religion, or you depart from your, princip your, 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 your principles of faith and your belief, you have apostatized. Now, the word says in Hebrews 10, 38, I'm going to go there just so that we can actually read it together. Uh, Hebrews 10, 38. Hebrews 10, 38. It says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So the just live by faith, but anyone draws back. It just simply tells us that some may choose to draw back. So this salvation, this gift of eternal life is given to us, but even with that, some may draw back. I don't want to be one to draw back, friends. I don't want to be the one to draw back. And so I would say that this salvation is something that we can indeed lose because we choose not to accept it. So a determination, therefore, must be made 
when this judgment time comes as to who has made their choice to accept eternal life. There must be some determination made before the saved button gets clicked. Who has retained their status of saved? God has given us all eternal life. He has said it. He has given it to all of us. But we have to choose to accept eternal life. See, once you accept and you believe, again, you are instantly credited with the righteousness of Christ. You are instantly credited with pardon from your sin, and your name is written in the book, the books of heaven, the book of life. Scripture tells us that while salvation is a present reality for one that believes, it may be forfeited, and that saved condition can be lost. So you whose status has been set to saved, you can remove yourself from this saved condition. The word and the one who is the word gives us every admonition, every encouragement to stay saved. Here's some of his his encouragements. It says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. This is the word of God, his testimony. He has given us the encouragement that we should stay saved. Now, the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not to, to, to look at those who draw back. Uh, let me read that again. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, which is sin, but to those, but of those who believe to the saving of, so, of our soul. So the just shall live by faith, that's the encouragement, but those that draw back, the Lord is not pleased with them. So another encouragement he has for us is to stay connected and stay in our saved, open, accepting of eternal life status. Another one is that he says, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one may take your crown. That's in Revelation 2.20. Now, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the city, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. That's in Revelation 22. So you see that God is giving us plenty of information in the word to tell us that while we have been given the gift of eternal life, we also are encouraged to stay in our acceptance of the gift of eternal life. So the same way that we know that we are saved because God said it, and I believe it, and he's already proved it, we must also realize that if we fall away from grace... We remove ourselves from the abiding relationship with him. We are removing ourselves and removing our names from the book of life. We are making that choice. So how can I know that I'm saved? I've got to abide in the word. I've got to let my joy be full. I've got to not practice sin. And you know what? Then I can know and have the assurance that I have eternal life. And we will then be left if we choose not to stay in the, uh, the, the acceptance of God's grace in our lives, we are going to be left with no covering for our sin. If you are left with no covering for your sin, you're standing in the courtroom of heaven. Right now, Jesus is, when you have accepted his righteousness, you are standing there. He is standing in front of you. The judge can't see you. He is covering you. He is is protecting you and shielding all of your bad, all of your failure, all of your uh, abandonment of God's word. He's covering that. So you stay in the acceptance, the fullness of Jesus Christ. He will be your covering. So we don't want to be left without a covering. We don't want to be left to stand on our own. 
we don't want to be left to stand with our own sinfulness being available for everyone and for God to see. We learned a few weeks ago from Pastor Gittins in one of his messages that there was this place called what? The City of Refuge. And this is where the person who was a murderer could go and flee. And as long as they stayed in the City of Refuge, they were safe, they were free to stay in that place, and they were not subject to the avenger of whoever they had murdered. So they were in the city, that was their, their refuge, their salvation. But the minute that they chose to come outside of the city, they were free to be avenged the death that they caused. They were then no longer protected, they were no longer covered by the refuge that the city provided. Jesus Christ has given us eternal life. He has given us salvation. He has given us his grace to cover us and to protect us, to be our refuge. When we don't accept it, we are going outside the city of refuge. We don't want to be out there because we want to be on the inside so that we, when the final judgment comes, we will be with a saved status. I don't want you to leave here today without knowing that if we don't remain steadfast to the end, we don't abide in this life of grace. I don't want you to leave here today thinking that I'm good because, oh, I'm good. I don't want you to leave here today thinking that if I step outside the city of refuge that somehow, you know, I'm going to be okay. But I am not covered by the righteousness of Christ when I choose not to accept his righteousness. Friends, we've got to be steadfast. You see, God has given us his word. He's given us his sacred writings, which are able to make us what? Wise unto salvation. When we are wise unto salvation through faith, it's through the faith that we have in Jesus Christ that he has covered our sin. So uh, here's what I want to I do. I want to give you this illustration as I get ready to close. How many of you know like the term desktop publishing? This is like being in like a Word document and, you know, you're creating something. There are a lot of people that make greeting cards. I know someone here in this, this church that makes greeting cards on, on their computer and they give a nice word and a nice encouragement to someone. And so you have like a picture that you can put on the card. You can set it in your document. And let's say this, this, this picture is a picture of a person. It's a picture of a sinful person. But you can take from your clip art bank another picture and cover the picture. Let's say you get a picture, and the picture that you choose to cover this sinful image is a lamb. Now, this lamb is a, a kind and docile creature. But you know what? As soon as you drag it from your clip art and you place it over the, over the picture of the sinful image, guess what? You can't see it anymore. Even though it remains, it's covered. You can't see it in the document. You can't see it in the book because it has been covered by this new image. This new image is the righteousness of Christ, friends. And do you know that you can continue to change this document? This is the life we're in right now. We are that sinful image. We are that sinful image. We accept Christ's righteousness. It can then cover our sinful image. But while we're still preparing this document here, we are in the edit phase. Right now, we are in the edit phase of life. We are in the investigative judgment period before the final decree is made. See, when you're in this document, you can click over here and you can slide the image. You can change the image. You could have this image. You could have that image. You can change this document as many times as you want. You can go, you can, you can actually edit and click undo as many times as you want. But guess what happens once you click save? 
Can you edit the document anymore? Can you click undo? Whatever you have done is done. There's no more undo after the status of saved has been checked off. You're out of the edit mode. You see, there is going to come a day when we are out of the edit mode. We have heard that Jesus is coming soon. More so than ever before, Jesus is coming soon, friends. See, this is a metaphor, this edit phase to describe God's system of salvation. He has accepted, we, he has given us the gift of eternal life. We can choose because he has given us free will to come and to go. Sometimes we're in, sometimes we fall away. We are a body of believers who have been well established in the word. But sometimes, even though we were like pathfinders or deacons or deaconess, or we were reared up into our school, in our schools, understanding the doctrine of God, the doctrine of his word, I don't know, was I taught about, am I saved? I was taught what not to eat. I was taught where not to go. I was taught not what music to listen to. I was taught, I was taught about uh, how to build a family. I was taught about who to yoke up with and who not to yoke up with. All these things I was taught, but I don't know if I can recall hearing the conversation that you are saved, that you have eternal life. I've heard sermon after sermon. I heard uh, sermon after sermon in the pew. I heard sermon after sermon on the radio or wherever. But you know, it's important to know that all of these things I was hearing, that it didn't just become background music in my life. Or, you know, you go and you, you watch a movie, there's this score that's always running. You hear this theme of music. And these are all these things that we've been taught through life, thought, taught through our Christian experience. But then, what about this message of salvation? When my own family dynamics changed, I had to wrestle. Like, am I saved if my marriage doesn't stay What is the faith that I had to have? Did I know that if this thing is wrong in my life or this thing didn't come right in my life according to the way that everyone else thinks it's supposed to be? Did it mean that I was not saved anymore? God had already given me the gift of eternal life. I had to choose it. And no matter how much the devil tried to tell me, well, you're not worthy. You don't need a, you don't deserve eternal life if this thing is wrong in your life. No, I'm choosing eternal life. Satan, you get behind me. The Bible, the Bible says that we can go into heaven maimed. We can go into heaven with one eye. It's better for us to go into heaven with one eye, one arm, than to go into hell, busting hell wide open with all of what we have. So what we are told, friends, is that eternal life is ours. We have to choose it. We have to accept it. It is there for us. God has promised us. He has already promised us. He has already proved it. Friends, we have eternal life. Let us stay in the city of refuge. Let's not let the edit mode go out to the saved mode. Once we click that save button... Once that save button is clicked, there's no more undo, friends. There's no more coming and going. My brothers and my sisters, the day is coming when the save button will be activated. And when that saved button is activated, that is the day that the record of all our edits will be finalized. This finalization process will be completed before the return of Christ. With its resurrection, 
with the resurrection of those that are sleeping and with the saints who will be caught up to meet him in the air, this is when the finalization process will take place. You see, God will return. Jesus will return. And it's at that time that the redeemed of the Lord, those who have chosen to accept and to live with joy and to live with confidence and to live with the salvation that he has freely given to them, that they will remain and that they will be safe in the city of refuge. Their choice to accept the gift of God, eternal life, will forever be saved. That day is described in Revelation 22, 11, and 12. It says that he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. It says he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. It says he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. The day is coming, friends, where Jesus will stand up and he will say it is done. When he says that it will be done, that is when our salvation will come. We have been made a a record will tell us what it is and the choice that we have made. There's no Jesus is coming back and then we have a chance to make a choice. Now is the time to make your choice, friends. Stay in the city of refuge. I would say that those who accept salvation, they receive eternal life. They receive it immediately, but they can later renounce it. We don't want to renounce that decision because this is the decision that will will determine our eternal destiny. Except for the purpose of bringing all things to closure, there will come a time when the Lord will announce his decision, your decision, your choices as final. You see, there is no other love like this love. No other love like this love. There's no other love like this love in this universe. He loves you too much, that's Jesus, to let you go without putting up a fight. So I want you to think about this. Think about the love of God to send his son to die for your sins. And do you know that if it was just one person, he would have still left all of heaven to save that one person. But here we are, a body of believers, as different as our faces are, as different as our sins are, as different as our needs are, God gave us eternal life. He gave us the gift of eternal life. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to be starting to meditate and to think about the goodness of God and his love for each of us. See, Jesus, he longs to live forever with you. He invites you to come. He invites you to come back. He invites you to come to him right now. He invites you to come back to him right now. So you can come to him. You can come to him with all of your guilt because you chose him and then you left him. You can come to him with your record of sinful edits. And you can come to him with your heartache. And you can come to him with your pain. You can remain with him, abiding with him, so that your joy would be full. If you feel the the tug of war that goes on when you get to the decision-making process, That's the Lord fighting for you. His angels are there to fight for you. Don't you know that the the devil and his angels fear the power of the name of Jesus? So when there is a, a war going on within you that you say, I need to choose you, Lord. I need to stay with you, Lord. And something's telling you, oh, not right now, not right now. That's Jesus fighting for you. Choose him, my brothers. Choose him, my sisters. Remain with the Lord. 
receive his grace, receive his pardon, receive his righteousness, let it cover you, his strength, his power. Our weakness is made perfect in his strength. If you want to come to him, I want to invite you to come. We have pastor, we have elders that can come and pray with you. If you want to come back to him, whatever it is, you can stand to your feet and say, Lord, I want to remain in the city of refuge with you. I want to know that, Lord, you've given me this wonderful gift. And I want to say in my heart right now, I want to say with my hand raised, or I want to say by standing to my feet or coming to the altar, that, Lord, I accept your gift of salvation. And if you accept it, make your choice today. Make your choice today. If you want to come, I want to ask you to just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the gift of eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that when I war and you war with my soul, dear Father, that demons will tremble because of your power. So, Father, I just ask you, Lord, right now, that your people, as they are standing or they're wrestling in their hearts, Lord, that they would humble themselves, dear Father, in such a way that they can receive, Lord, the gift that you have so delicately given. Father, say with me right now, Lord, say with me, friends, that, dear Lord, I've come to you right now. Thank you for your incredible, your incomprehensible. Thank you for your incredible. Thank you for your incomprehensible love. You revealed it, Lord, on Calvary's cross. This is where, Lord, you proved it. And, Lord, I believe to it that it was your desire to save me. So thank you, Lord, for bearing my guilt. Thank you, Lord, for bearing my sin. So, Lord, right now, I give you my life, and I accept your free gift of eternal life. In the name of Jesus, the one who covers us, let us all say amen. The Lord is good. He gives us eternal life. We have to accept it. We have to stay in the, the city of refuge. If you long to have encouragement and you need that encouragement, I'm going to encourage you to find someone to pray with. We have elders here. They can pray with you. We have a pastor here. She can pray with you. Your choice should be Jesus. Friends, how can I know that I am saved? God said it. I believe it. And he's already proved it. Amen. I will sing of Jesus' love, number 183.
final verse? Nothing good. 